So this talk is not for you. This theatre, it's not for you. Soho, our creative heartland, this place is not for you. Growing up in Newcastle in the north of England, I was told time and again why culture and creativity was not for the likes of me and my family. When she was little, my mum was a really talented dancer and she wanted to study ballet. But she was told that ballet was not for her and she should get a proper job instead. And my dad, when he was a little boy, was brilliant at making things with his hands. And at school, he got the chance to excel at pottery. But he too was told that this was a mere hobby and he should get a secure job in the shipyards instead. The overriding memory of my childhood is of my mum and dad being made redundant again and again and again from these so-called safe jobs, and of them each juggling three rolls each to try and make ends meet. And despite this, they always made the time to teach me and my brother to be creative, to write stories, to sing songs, to craft and to make. They taught us the value of a creative skill set. And at school, I loved creative subjects. And when the time came, I really wanted to study English literature at university. But my teachers told me, an arts degree? That's not for you. What on earth are you going to do with English? Become a writer. There's no writers around here. <laughs> if you want to do that, you'll have to go away to the south where the opportunities are. And I did go away. And as the first in my family to go to university, I did for a while think it might not be for me. I saw privilege everywhere, and it was just like a game I didn't understand the rules to. But university was transformational for me. It was a lever to opportunity, and it opened doors I didn't even know existed. More importantly, it taught me that the good people show you where those doors are, and they teach you how to hold them open for the people who come after you. And I became an academic. Another job I did not know existed. And again, I found myself in rooms full of grey men in grey suits. And they told me, academia is not for you. And told me that I looked more like a hairdresser than a professor in my dresses and heels. But I persisted, because we do, don't we, ladies? And it just sharpened my interest in access and representation of who gets to sit around that table and make those decisions. And I began to research and publish on creative diversity and reach out beyond academia to work with creatives and diplomats and policymakers. And I realized that real change, it's a team game and it requires a diverse range of players. And it was working with that diverse range of players that we began to develop national change programs that focused on identifying and supporting diverse new creative talent. Our first program was called Common People, and it focused on the persistent underrepresentation of working class writers in the UK publishing industry today. Common People comprised a writing development program, networking, and mentoring. And it sought to build confidence, industry connections, peer support for our writers, and generate a new talent pipeline to the publishing industry. The project was really significant because it marked the first time all of England's regional writing development agencies had come together around a shared challenge with a university and a publisher. And this collaborative model really worked. Another element of the project that worked really well was mentoring. One of the writers told me that his experience of mentoring on the program was a little bit like hummus and olives, something he'd only tried in his 30s but now really liked. And we launched Common People in May 2020, the first lockdown. So terrible timing, but there was no time to lose. And because we launched online, we really relied on our allies to help us amplify our message. 
and one of those allies was the actor Michael Sheen. Michael and I had known each other for a while. We have similar values and beliefs and backstories. And we both increasingly worried that the pathways that we take into success were slowly closing behind us. And it was during that first lockdown that he and I were sitting at our respective kitchen tables, me in Newcastle, him and poor Talbot on Zoom, and we started to plot. And we developed a new national change program, this time one that would look at an area really close to Michael's heart, the underrepresentation of working class journalists in the UK media industry, the issue of who gets to tell stories about the UK today. The program we developed became a writing chance. And across the next 12 months, we took a writing chance from our kitchen tables to the House of Lords. We changed the lives of our writers, our partners, everyone from the New Statesman to the Daily Mirror and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. We created a brand new BBC podcast series called From Margins to Mainstream, which you can please download now. <laughs> and we impacted industry practice and government policy. Not bad for a lockdown Zoom call. And it was sitting in the House of Lords on these big old fancy gold chairs that I remember Michael leaning over to me and saying, if this is what we can do in lockdown, imagine what we can do when the industry opens up again. And there was that hope, that optimism, that belief that when we did open up again, things should be better, fairer, the opportunity should be everywhere. And it was with this in mind that I was asked to write an all-party parliamentary group inquiry report into what our creative industries needed to rebuild, recover, and rebalance post-COVID. That report heard evidence from over 900 creatives across the sector, and it sings new songs and tells new stories about the value of the creative industries to the UK economy today. Because the value of culture lies as much in pounds and pence as it does in hearts and minds. The Arts and Humanities Research Council tell us that pre-pandemic, our UK creative industries were generating more in terms of gross value added to the economy than automotive, aerospace, life science, and oil and gas combined. They were 6% of our national economic output, and they were growing at four times the rate of any other sector. Even during the pandemic, Creative industries like publishing, video game design, film and TV production, they continued to boom. And our freelancers continued to create content in the most difficult of circumstances. And now, now we have to get up off our knees together. Creative diversity is quite simply about making room for everybody. It's a matter of social justice, not just of representation. And today, well, today I am a Geordie boomerang. I've gone south and I've gone back north again. And I've been joined in the north of England by a whole host of creative industries, everyone from Channel 4 and the BBC to Fullwell 73 and Hachette, who've devolved their activities into the regions and nations to spread opportunity and create new talent pipelines. And we're working together to think about skills gaps, role modelling, and how we teach the next generation that creative careers are as much about being a carpenter and a production accountant as they are about being an actor or a dancer. And I'm heading up a new Arts and Humanities Research Council Creative Communities Programme, where we're looking at that model of collaborative partnership working and thinking about how we can scale it up to help communities up and down the country co-design and co-deliver culture to author their own futures. Because no one deserves to live in black and white. Culture illuminates. It adds colour to our lives and it connects us like nothing else. If you think back to your seven-year-old selves, would they have thought that you'd be here today? doing the job you do, living the life you live. Culture changes lives. It's changed mine and yours. But the challenge now is to protect and pass on that transformative potential to the next generation. Because this is not a rehearsal, and it is never too late. 
Last year, at the age of 65, my mum had her first ballet lesson. And this year, my birthday, I received the most beautiful handmade jug from my dad, who took up pottery again at the age of 76. And on the jug was a note. And all it said was, I'm sorry this took 40 years. And so am I. We have not got time to waste. Culture is for me. It is for you. Culture should be by and for everybody. With Michael and others, we're going to take our creative diversity work forwards. And we would like to extend an open invitation to everybody watching to join us. Because the biggest change you can make, the biggest legacy you can leave, is to give others a writing chance. Thank you.